And if you can turn with me to a well-known uh, Bible scripture found in Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah chapter 29, and we're going to read verse 11. Do you have your Bibles? Yes. Have you found Jeremiah? Not yet? Have you found Jeremiah? Yeah. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, reads as follows. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Amen. Lord, once again, as we go into a time of your word, we just pray that our hearts and minds and ears will be open to receive everything that you have in store for us, that it will fall on good ground, that it may grow in our hearts and be lived out in our day-to-day -day lives in order for us to walk according to the word and the scripture that you have given us. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. So the title of what I want to share with you today is two words, and it's all in, all in. So turn to two or three people and say to them, you've got to be all in. Now, if you've grown up in evangelical Pentecostal circles, you will be familiar with yearly declarations. They sound a little bit like this. 2009, the blessings are mine. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And it's always better when it rhymes, right? Yeah. The year 2020 is the year of plenty. plenty. Wow. The year 2023... The year of God's glory. It's always good when it rhymes. And many of you, if you've grown up in those circles, will be familiar with such declarations. I have nothing against people who make those declarations. But oftentimes what I see is believers who make those declarations. And when the year doesn't quite pan out as they declared, they become discouraged. I am not naive to know that even though this is only the first Sunday of, uh, of March and we've only just entered into March, that there are some people, when they look at the declarations that they've made at the beginning of this year and the goals that they've made for this year, have already given up. They've already said, actually, I'm going to stop declaring a year to be a thing. I'm going to stop declaring my goals at the beginning of the year because I've done this previously and not quite seen what I wanted to see. In the same vein, there are many believers who quote well-known scriptures just like the one we read in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. They quote the fact that God thinks good thoughts towards them, thoughts of peace and not of evil, and that he has a future and a hope for them. But again, as they journey throughout the year, as they journey throughout their day-to-day -day spiritual walk, when they don't see the verses in which they have been declaring over their life come to pass, they begin to question that which they have been declaring to the extent that some become disappointed in themselves and disappointed towards God. Again, I have no problem with people taking scripture and declaring the scriptures over their lives. However, it's very important that when we declare the scriptures over our lives, that we also look at the caveat and the conditions that come with the promises that we are declaring over our lives. For example, we read verses like Jeremiah 29 verse 11, which says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And we shout amen and we get happy and we stop there. But actually, when you look at verse 12 and 13, it says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. In other words, it's not just enough to claim the promise you still need to go and seek him. You still need to go and pray. You still need to go and spend time in his presence. And what happens is people declare the promise, but often miss out on the caveat. This is why people will say things, and I'm sure you've heard it, like Abraham's blessings are mine. Have you heard that? Yeah. And when people say that, I'm like, but are Abraham's trials yours? Are Abraham's patience yours? Because we always declare the promise, but we forget that there's a caveat and a condition that comes with the promise. Not out of works, because we're saved by grace, but out of our commitment to this walk in Christ. 
And one of the things that I started to see when I looked at the promises of God in scripture is a familiar pattern with these scriptures. That pattern being that God wants all of our heart, all of our soul and all of our mind when it comes to following him. That he does not want a part of our lives or a part of our heart. He wants us to be all in. Tell the person next to you, you've got to be all in. And so as I began to study scriptures, I started to see this pattern of God desiring us to be all in. And here are a couple of examples. Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 7. Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God. For they shall return to me with their whole heart. Some of their heart? Part of their heart? Their whole heart. Heart. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 29. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if, someone say if, if. that's the condition. If you seek him with, talk to me, preach to me, with, all. with all your heart and with all your soul. A well-known scripture that you would have heard me talk about many a times if you come to this church regularly that illustrates how God wants us to be all in is found in Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 to 16. It says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. And literally, I can hear the aircon going as we read that. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. As I say, if you've been coming to this church for a while, you would have heard me explain that if there was anybody that knew and understood this metaphor, it was the people of Laodicea. And the reason being is that the people of Laodicea had no water in their city. They had to pump it into their city through an aqueduct from two neighboring cities, Hierapolis and Colossae, which is where we get the book of Colossians from. And by the time they would pump the water into their city, it would become contaminated, it would become mucky, it would be lukewarm. And when the people drank it, they would spew it out. So they understood this metaphor literally. And God was saying, listen, I wish that you would either choose to be fully cold rather than be one foot in and one foot out. Isn't that true of us? You'd rather have someone who's going to be a real friend than be a friend sometime-ish and then be something else another time, right? And God says, listen, I'd rather you be fully out than be one foot in and one foot out or be fully in. And of course, he would prefer for us to be all in. But standing on the fence is good to no one. Being lukewarm is good to no one. I always say a lukewarm cup of tea is good for nothing or no one. A lukewarm super malt. It's a tragedy, right? And God doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He wants us to be all in. Someone say all in. In order to experience the fullness of God in our lives and to grow in intimacy with him, we need to be all in. I like to say to people, think about this. We've just finished Relationship Matters and I say, think about this. You would never accept part commitment from a partner or from a spouse. If they said to you, I love you, but only 90%. Rubbish. I love you a, a lot, 70, 80%, but I'm not sure that I'm fully in this. You would not accept that. Yet Jesus calls the church his bride. And again, he doesn't want you to be 70, 80, 90% in. He wants you to be all in. Now, aside from the scripture that I just read to you in Revelation, some people will say, but that's great, Pastor K, but all of the scriptures you gave us, mainly, most of them, they're Old Testament. Well, I can prove to you that this also applies in the New Testament with just quoting one scripture, the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us. What did he say? Love the Lord God with all your heart with your soul with your mind so we see this pattern in the new testament also and what i want to do is show you four men in the new testament 
who had the opportunity to be all in with Christ. And we want to see whether they were able to do this or not, whether they passed the test or not, or whether they failed to be all in. So turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 9. Again, a well-known piece of scripture that I have preached many times at the church, probably the most preached piece of scripture that I have preached here at the church. So for some of you, this will be a reminder, whilst I appreciate that for some of you, this will also be a new uh, um, insight for you. But we're reading from Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through to 62. Have you found Luke chapter 9? Yes. Well, I'll read it from the screen. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In this scripture, in Luke, we come across three men. All three men have the opportunity to follow Jesus. The first man, when He's given this opportunity to follow Jesus. Jesus turns around and says something to him, which I love about Jesus because it's very different from how we would respond as believers today. When Jesus turns around and says to this guy um, in verse 57, sorry, when this guy turns around and says, I will follow you, Jesus turns and says to him in verse 58, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, when this man says he wants to follow Jesus, the first thing Jesus does is says, if you want to follow me, it won't be comfortable. It won't be an easy road. And I love that because in this day and age, if people turn around and say, I want to follow Jesus, we'll be like, that's great. He's going to turn your mess into a message. He's going to turn your test into a testimony. No one tells you about the struggles you're going to have as a believer, the things you're going to have to say no to. No one tells you that most of the challenges you're going to have to deal with when it comes to people are actually going to be other Christians as opposed to your unsafe friends. But we won't go there today. Tell the person next to you, tell him to behave. And he says to this guy, if you're following me, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. This man wanted comfort. I told you before, Jesus didn't die so that you can have a soft life. He says you will be persecuted because of me. So it should not be a surprise to you if you are persecuted and you face challenges in your walk. This man wanted the comfort of following Jesus. He didn't want to have any sacrifices or deal with the fact that Jesus was telling him this earth isn't our home. It's a temporary home. And therefore you'd have to live a life like that if you're going to follow me and decides not to be all in. The second man that Jesus encounters, what I love about him is that he extends the invitation to himself. Nobody asked him, but he said, Lord, I will follow you. How many of you know people like that? You'd be like, I'm going to go home first and then I, I might go to the cinema. And they're like, cool, what time shall I join you? And you're like, yeah, but you see, the thing is, I'm going to go to the cinema. And this man says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, that's fine, but let the dead bury the dead. Because this man said, let me first go and bury my father. Which, when you think about it in your day-to-day -day life, isn't a problem. One's father's just passed, you want to go and bury him before following Jesus, not a problem. But many of you would have heard me explain before that the reason why Jesus said let the dead go and bury the dead is because he knew this man's motives. Because in biblical times, if you were the eldest in your family, you had to be present at your father's funeral in order to gain his inheritance. So this man wanted to get his inheritance first before following Jesus. Jesus, knowing his motive, said, listen, let the dead go and bury the dead. In other words, leave the inheritance and the money and come and follow me. The last person said, let me go and say goodbye to my friends. Again, no problem. But the reason why he did it is because he was having doubts. That's why Jesus said, whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. 
So in him saying, let me first go and say bye to those who are in my house and let me go and say bye to my friends, he was hoping that by the time he speaks to his family and his friends, they would convince him differently. They would convince him not to embark on this journey. And so Jesus said, whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God, which is interesting because in those days, if you were plowing and you looked back, you would actually go off track, but you would not feel like you were going off track. You would feel like you were still on track if you were plowing and you looked back. And Jesus was saying that when you put your hand to the plow and look back, it feels like you're on track, but actually you are off track. When you put your hand to the plow and you're saying, Lord, I want to follow you, but I still want to do these things with my unsaved friends. I still want to live this worldly lifestyle in these areas. Actually, it feels like you're on track, but you're actually going off track. All these free men had an invitation to be all in and they all failed. But they weren't the only one. There was a man that we refer to in the Bible as the young rich ruler. Remember him? We find him in Mark chapter 10 and you can turn there with me if you want to. I'm going to read from verse 17 onwards. It says, Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? Ask the person next to you, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to them, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. This man thought he had ticked all the boxes. Yeah, I honor my mother and father. I don't commit adultery. I do this, I do that. Jesus said, mm, but there's one thing that you lack. Go and sell all your possessions and follow me. I like to say that the uh, young rich ruler was probably a single lady's dream. He was young, he was rich, someone say amen. He was a ruler, probably had a beard. But the one thing he was able, unable to do was to sacrifice everything and follow God. Now I'm, I'm fully, fully aware that up until this point in which I've been speaking to you, when I'm talking to you about being all in, maybe you assumed or thought that I was talking about being all in in terms of being a believer or surrendering your life to Christ. I'm fully aware that that's where some of you may have thought I was going today. No. When I talk about being all in, I'm not talking about being a believer. I'm not even talking about surrendering your life to Christ, even though those things are important. What I'm talking about today when I'm talking about being all in I'm referring to you being all in, in your trust in God and your trust towards God. Oh, but PK, I fully trust God. So you may, so you may think. Because when I looked at those three men in Luke and I looked at the young rich ruler, I looked at those things and I thought that their issues were comfort and convenience and friendship and money. But the Holy Spirit said to me, these are all just subcategories of one thing, their inability to fully trust in me. Now I'm going to say something that when you think about it, as harsh as it may sound, you'll actually realize it's true. And what I'm going to say to you is this. If there is even one area in your life, just one, where you are not trusting God, you are not fully trusting God. I'll prove it to you. Let's say God told you to bless me with 10,000 pounds. That's where you say amen. If I said it the other way around, people would be like, amen, I'll receive it. That's what I love about believers, you know. You say to them, listen, um, God, God, God told me to tell you that you should, you should bless me 
with some money. They'll be like, mm, okay, let me pray about it. I'll come back to you, which is code for no. <laughs> but when it's the other way around, oh, God told me to bless you. There's no praying about whether to receive it or not. It's give me that, give me that. And in, <laughs> and in the scripture, we see a number of men like the ones I just pointed out to you who in one area of their lives lack trust and as a result, they were not fully trusting in God. If God tells me to give you 10,000 pounds and I give you 9,000 pounds, have I fully obeyed? No. What if I give you 9,999 pounds? What if I give you 9,999 pounds and 99 pence? If it's just one pence short, I've not been obedient in giving you the full amount. Likewise, if there's just one area, just one area in our lives where we are not fully trusting in God, it means that we as believers are not wholeheartedly trusting in him. And so my question to you today is, what is the one area of your life, in this season of your life, where you're not fully trusting in God? Or maybe it's not one thing, maybe it's many things. Martha, Martha, you are worried about many things. And isn't it interesting to note that Martha worried about many things in the presence of Jesus. Do you know how many of us worry about things even though God is in our midst? What is the one thing or the number of areas in your life where you are failing to fully trust God? What is that area that is stopping you from being all in? Because let me tell you this, a lack of trust isn't necessarily spoken, it's revealed in your actions. It's revealed in your behavior. When you don't trust the person in the natural, you don't go up to them and say, um, God told me to tell you, I don't trust you in it. Sometimes you might tell a person you don't trust them, but in most cases, what we do is we just adjust our behavior to reflect how we feel about them. And the same thing happens when we don't fully trust God. We might not say it, but we adjust our behavior that replicates that which doesn't fully trust in God. I used to come to church and I used to tell God, I am all in. I surrender my life to you. I would come to church and I would sing songs like, my life is not my own. Don't worry about the pitch. <laughs> Worship team, help me out. How did it go? <laughs> my life is not my own. <laughs> I give my, this side is not singing. I give myself to, I would sing songs like that. Lord, my life is not my own. I surrender my life to you. I am all in. And then one day, God said to me, couldn't they? I want you to be a pastor. I said, which couldn't <laughs> I said, I want my own life back. <laughs> because how many of you know it's easy to be all in until you're challenged to do something you don't want to do? Yeah. It's easy to come to church and sing songs and lift up hands and declare a thing. But actually, when the tough gets going, when he tells you to give something to that person, when he tells you to go and pray for that person, when he tells you to forgive that person, when he tells you to go and make peace with that person, when he tells you to make a decision that doesn't agree with your logic, then we will know whether you're all in. And I remember running away from the call as long as I could. And some of you may know my story, but to keep it brief, I told God, you're going to have to do something out of the ordinary to convince me that this is what you want me to do. And I remember one day I was going to Colchester University, University of Essex in Colchester, I should say. And I got off the train and I got into this cab. And I remember being in this cab and the guy asked me, what are you, what are you doing down here? You're going to the uni, you're going to rave and that kind of thing. I said, no, I'm just going to, to speak to a group. And he didn't say anything to me for a good few minutes after that. And then we got to the traffic light. And he stopped and he turned and looked at me and he said, so why are you running away from the call of God in your life to be a pastor? I said, sorry? If it wasn't for child lock, I would have got out. He said, yeah, as soon as you got in the cab, God told me he's called you to be a pastor, but it's going to take something extraordinary like a stranger like me telling you that before you obey the call. And how many of you know there's only so much running you can do from God before you decide that you have to be all in? But here's the joke. 
Even when I became a pastor, I would still have moments where I found myself not being all in. Not through a lack of commitment, but not fully trusting God. I thought I gave my anxieties to God, but rather I realized that I was using logic alone to do spiritual work. And if you're a leader and a Christian, you cannot lead and do work by logic alone. You have to have your spiritual eyes open. But I was doing spiritual work by logic alone. I relied on structures. I relied on systems. I relied on people and teams when Jesus said he will build his church, not me. And the funny thing is, if you saw me, you would commend my passion. This guy is hardworking. Like he's really on it. No, (laughs) I was fearful as to whether God was going to build his church through the expression of this church. And so what looked like me being all in was actually me, me working from a place of fear, working from a place of anxiety. And sometimes it can appear that you're all in, but actually you're driven by your fear and your anxiety. Tell the person next to you, you've got to be all in. Has it ever occurred to you that your lack of trust in God might actually be the current cause of your anxieties above anything else? that you're pointing the finger at other things and trying to justify this and say this, but actually, it's your lack of trust in God. Has it ever occurred to you that you can worship God with the fruit of your lips, but your heart may be far from him? Has it ever occurred to you that you don't trust that he's going to provide for you and your family, even though you come to church and you sing Jaira? And again, it's revealed in your toil, in your thoughts, in your behavior, in withholding your tithes, in withholding your giving? Has it ever occurred to you that you may give God your worship, your time, your service, serve in church, but actually you don't trust that he can bring your stray child or children back to him? You don't believe that he can save your marriage or save that business or he can refuel your ministry or your spiritual walk? You don't believe that he can give you the child that you're believing him for and therefore as a result you find yourself leaning on your own understanding rather than trusting in him lord i trust you in my career but in my relationships i'm going to manage this because i'm getting older and another relationship matters has gone by and still there isn't no one there so lord you can have this part of my life but i'm gonna manage this lord i trust that you will heal them but for my health hmm, i'm not sure it's been a while Isn't it funny how we always think that our prayers and advice work best for others, but not ourselves? Lord, it's been a while and I'm still out of work. Friends are inviting me out to dinner and I'm still using the line that there's rice and stew at home (laughs) because you're not making a way for me. Lord, I've waited so long for this job and now you're giving me all of these problems? Lord, I waited so long for a partner. I waited so long for this promise. And now all I feel is shame and lack of failure because the promise didn't pan out as expected. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 reminds us that we should trust in the Lord with some of our heart, all of your heart, and lean not on your own understanding that's what it means to be all in that's what it means to come into a place of rest which is our theme for this year it's to know that everything happens for a reason and there is a season and timing for everything i've come to learn that when small disappointments come from missing the bus to missing the train to missing the flight that everything happens for a reason i guarantee you that a lot of those people who missed their bus or their train or their cab into the World Trade Center on 9-11 will not complain no more when they miss a bus or a train or a plane. I wonder how many times we forget that when we get upset about the small disappointments that actually maybe God is saving you from major tragedies. And maybe you've just got to trust him and be all in. Yes, you might not see what God is doing, but trust that he's doing something. Trust that he's up to something because his word says he never leaves you nor forsakes you. He says he never puts you to shame. He is molding you like clay at the potter's will. And therefore, we just need to trust in God. A lack of trust in God causes us so much stress, 
so much depression, so much anxiety, and that's why we are told to be anxious for nothing but to bring our supplications to him. We think we need to know all the answers. We don't. We just need to put our faith and trust in him. He says, my yoke is easier, my burden is light. And we have got to take that upon our hearts and trust in him in every area of our lives. As we close this morning, I want you to think about your spiritual life, your spiritual walk and where you are on your journey. And I want you to think about whether there is an area or a number of areas where you can honestly say, actually, I'm not fully trusting God in this area. I don't say it, but actually it's revealed in my prayer language. It's revealed in my thoughts. It's revealed in my heart. And if you're here and watching online, wherever you are, if there's at least an area of your life where you're saying, actually, I need to trust God again. Would you just stand where you are? Because I want to pray for you. Even those of you watching online, stand wherever you are. I know that sometimes it can be virtually impossible to trust God in every single area of our lives. Even at the best of times. But a lot of times we get distracted with what's happening in our environment that we miss the lessons that God is teaching us in that moment in order for us to build our trust in him. And talking of Martha a few moments ago, when Jesus said, Martha, Martha, I want you to know that in biblical language, whenever a name is called twice, it is done out of compassion, it is done out of endearment, it is done out of love. Moses, Moses, Jacob, Jacob, Abraham, Abraham, God said in Genesis 22, 11, do not lay a hand on that son. Martha, Martha, when Jesus was calling Martha's attention, he wasn't doing it out of a rebuke. He was doing it out of love to say, hey, I see what's going on in your life, but I'm still here. And all you need to do is sit at my feet and learn from me and trust again. And so would you bow your heads right now for those of you who are standing and lift your hands to heaven. And whatever area or areas in your life that you know you need to trust God again, would you just begin to speak to God about those areas right now? Would you begin to open up your mouth and whatever those areas may be, Lord, I need to trust you again in my career. I need to trust you again in the area of provision. Lord, I need to trust you again that you will make a way for me when it comes to companionship, that you will make a way when it comes to healing, that you will make a way when it comes to friendships. Why don't you speak to him right now? Come on, open up your mouth, church, and begin to speak to him and say, Lord, forgive me. Help my unbelief where I have trusted in myself, where I have leaned on my own understanding and not trusted in you. Lord, would you forgive me and help me, Lord Jesus, to believe once again, to have faith in you, knowing that you are a God who makes a way where there seems to be no way. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. With all of our heads bowed and our eyes closed,